Hello and welcome, ambitious entrepreneurs. This is Elevate Your Business, your go-to podcast for game-changing insights and strategies. I'm your host, Ed Jurecki, and I'm thrilled to be your guide on this exciting journey of inspiration and empowerment, equipping you with the tools you need to take your venture to new heights. Today, we have with us Linda Grace Farley, a multifaceted expert in personal and professional development. As the founder of Cycles of Life Management and Coaching Services, Linda integrates body, mind, and spirit modalities to help clients achieve harmony in their professional and personal lives. Linda's philosophy centers on tailoring health plans to individual needs and assisting clients in identifying blocks and self-imposed limitations. With her wealth of experience as an author, professional, speaker, and distinguished hostmaster, Linda is here to guide us in unlocking your true potential. Linda, it is wonderful to see you again. How are you doing today? Excellent to outstanding in yourself. I am doing very well, thank you. Could you share a little bit more about yourself and your business with our audience? Sure. Cycles of Life Management Services came into play by my own personal development, and I saw how it helped me, and I wanted to be able to share it with others. Because in working in corporate America, you see a lot. And I was always the go-to person. Customer issue or employees, yeah, they just need to vent. So I said, why not? Let me just be able to help people. And my curiosity is for more growth. What's out there? What is our belief systems and how did we establish those? So that's how Cycles of Life Management Services came in, because what I'm doing is helping people to navigate the ebbs and flows of life. You know, it's not an easy ride. People think, oh, well, I always have to be happy. Well, that's not life. But you can work and strive to be happy. So that's what Cycles of Life does. So coaching my body, mind, and spirit there's so much science out there that you can make yourself sick or you can make yourself well. And I have seen and experienced it all. So how can I contribute to society? It's to help people to wake up and see what they have as a potential for healing themselves, for growth into understanding why they act like they do or function like they do. And that's what drives me. How beautiful is that? Absolutely love it. So how do you define success today? Oh, my answer to defining success as a feeling. You can get all kinds of data and saying, oh, well, you know, she's successful. He's successful because look at what they've accomplished. But if they don't have the right mindset, success isn't happening. Right. So my definition is it's the feeling, the feeling of being of accomplishment. It's the feeling of I fill in the blanks. That is success to me. If I see somebody that I've mentored turn around and create the most unbelievable business, and now they're on keynote speakers and such, it's not my success is success of others. That's how I gauge my success. And so that journey is never an easy one. And often it starts with a different definition. How has your definition of success evolved over time? Oh, well, the old me, I'll say, was you work hard and you get everything done, you know, and that people will recognize you. In corporate America, I could give, we could be here for hours uh, explaining how I was on the right path. I was doing exactly what was expected if you want to have, say, management or something to that effect. But that's not reality. So I believe from my own experience, and I could probably talk to others, they said, well, I did everything right. So why wasn't I successful? Entrepreneurs that open up restaurants, right? Why wasn't I successful? I did everything right. It's just not happening under that draconian way of thinking. You can be successful by changing your mindset and doing what your passion is. Everybody has a passion, right? And you'll find going back to that 
is what will help you define. So how has it changed me? I don't look at somebody else to complete me. I don't look at uh, a corporate job saying, oh, well, look what I've done. You know, are you going to recognize me? No, I don't do that. Now I listen to my instincts, my gut. And if it says, oh, Linda, you need to go here. I don't question it. I just do. And that has shown me how, yeah, we could call them higher guides. We could call it whatever. I call it my frequency. I'm tapping in and I will be successful. It's not a matter of, oh, well, am I going to be, right? No, I will be successful if I listen and take action. And through that journey, there's always a challenge or two. What are one or two of those challenges and the lessons learned to pass along to our audience? Getting past ourselves is one challenge, right? When I say about different techniques, there's a technique called applied kinesiology, and it's based about the response from the body. The body can't lie. It's a slave to the mind. And I'll ask, if I'm like in between, is this good for me? And then I do the muscle test. Oh, yeah, this is real good for me. You know, show me yes, show me no, you know? So getting past myself, I would say, because we are our own worst enemies, right? You can't do it if you have that mentality, right? The mind will continue to reinforce your belief system. That's the one thing. The second one was not to worry about what other people think of me. Oh, Linda, you can't do that. And that, that stems back to when I was a child, I was one of six. I had three older brothers and they'd love to climb trees and do boy stuff, right? And I'd be right behind them. And my mother would say, Linda, you can't do that. And but why? You know, so-and-so is doing it because you're a girl, you see? So when we are conditioned to believe that, right, we got to push past that conditioning. And then when you do, then there's a whole landscape. It's like a blank canvas that we can paint on. What do we want? Has anybody ever asked you, Ed, what do you want? So you're doing for everybody else. What is your identity? What's your why? And when you start sitting with that, will there be challenges? Absolutely, because that's years of conditioning. You know, oh, wait a minute, I better not say anything because, you know, who's going to listen to what I have to say? <laughs> you have a voice, right? You can articulate things. Your idea, your uh, whatever you want to share will be received, but you have to understand when, when to speak and when not to speak. Yeah. Timing and approach is everything, right? Oh, absolutely. Like we talked about human design. That's one of my things I have in my toolbox. If somebody comes in and they are, say, a manifesting generator, and they have the idea, they understand, they see something so blatant, obvious to them, and they want to contribute because they don't want people to suffer. But if they contribute without being asked to, then it will not be received well. So I tried this out. Life is an experiment, Ed, right? And I tried this out in my corporate America job. And I said, oh my goodness, it works. Because I waited and someone in the meeting said, Linda, what do you think of this? And then it was received very well. But the other side of me would tell them, oh, this is how it's, you know, look at, don't you see that? Their defenses comes up and who the heck am I to contribute, right? When I wasn't the management, I was just a worker bee. But if you know how to play with the energies, there's nothing stopping you. You just have to go with the flow, you know, okay. that navigation. Yeah, I think as business owners, that's incredibly great advice. In political situations within corporations, it often has a cultural component to it. Mm -hmm. So there are cultures out there that don't necessarily ask those questions of the individuals in the meeting. They are very comfortable just telling and informing versus inviting people into the conversation. So, And that's my experience. But uh, I agree with you that when we are asked for our input, it is the best opportunity to provide it in such a manner which you don't create an offensive or defensive demeanor as perceived by those others in the audience. 
But I just want to recognize the fact that for many out there, that may be less of an option than for the business owner who isn't responsible for their business and really needs to take that into consideration. Any thoughts around that? Well, business owners, their biggest asset is their staff. Uh, there's many examples out there where people turned around, you know, they thought, well, this is the way it should be. And they didn't listen to their staff. So now you're seeing more and more this generation, you don't respect me, I'm walking away. Right? There's something more to grow into. But when I've seen evidence of some of the business owners actually sitting down with their staff and saying, Talk to me. When you're there, now you have passed the gatekeeper and the gatekeepers in your reptilian brain, right? That's the one that's going to protect you. When you develop that communication, the trust factor comes in. And now they trust you to not steal their ideas, but now they can contribute to the betterment of the business. The ego is a powerful adversary and it's fed by you know, some of the conditions. So I would encourage, even if the business owners just sat down and had a circle meeting, because there's more stuff to that as well. If they're in a circle and they're having a conversation, they'd be amazed at how much information is shared. Agreed. Yeah. And I want to point back to what you said a little bit ago as well, which is it's essentially the readiness of the person, of the business owner to understand and adapt their behaviors, their mindset. And then, of course, their willingness to take action as a component of shifting their minds to be more open to new ideas and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I thought that was incredibly valuable input. And it's one of the challenges that I found most common out there is I can intellectually understand something, but am I emotionally ready to accept it and do something about it? Any comments to that? Well, yeah, it's interesting you would say that because your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. So on the outer world, there's so many ideas and people want to do this, 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 this. But if their inner world is not matching with the outer world, what their visions are, guess what? They will never be as successful as they want to be because their emotions are still in immaturity. So when people want to be successful, they have to sit and they have to do the work. They have to go inside and say, okay, what am I doing? Like a business owner, like you were saying. Don't give lip service to your employees. You go back and you say, okay, why is this happening? What, what can I do? And why am I doing it this way versus this way? Because you know as well as I do. There's some businesses that they read that if I do this, I'll get better feedback or I'll get more cooperation from my people, right? But it's all lip service. You have to embrace just like success, you have to embrace it. It's got to come from inside because the outside is your mirror from the inside. So if you feel that, oh, well, this is not going to work. Well, guess why it's not. Was it Henry Ford said that, you know, whatever you think is right. Either you say it's not going to work, it's, you're right. And if you say it is going to work, you're right. Because it's a reflection of your beliefs. It's a reflection of what you're doing and how you want to be. be. So... I think it was Henry Ford. I could be mistaken, but I remember that quote. You know, either way, you're right because you're fulfilling the prophecy. So I ask your audience, what prophecy are you fulfilling? That's a great question. So, yeah. shifting our conversation over to innovation today, it plays such an integral part. But when I define innovation, it's mm -hmm. all about people, process, and technology wrapped in the culture that produces one win win outcomes, one for the customer, one for the business, and one for all of the people, all of the stakeholders involved. So mm -hmm. when I define innovation that way, how do you see innovation driving your business success? And where do you see it going in the future? That's a good question. And I grew up with innovation. I 
I think there are a lot of good things out there today as an AI that is tremendously helping people. Because when I look at individuals, say reading or coming up with the words, they're not conditioned to come up with words for a, a script, a technical script, right? They got the ideas, but they just don't have the ability to articulate it. AI is helping tremendously in that respect. Now, you can't just let AI take it over, right? They are giving you a new dialogue. Now you got to see how close it is to what you're looking to do. And I could see that innovation being a deterrent in some ways, because it all counts on how much time are they using their time efficiently. If they just, oh, and I need to get this script done and you know, they, they use AI. AI can come up with something, but it's not genuine. Right. It's not them. They have to add a piece of themselves to the whole equation. I like CRMs as well, the CRM technology, because it takes the guesswork out. You've already done the work. Hey, I met this person, put it into the CRM. So I could see in the next couple of years that a lot of stuff is going to change because of innovations. Now, the challenge we have is trying to be able to see past the image or the illusion and understanding, is this real? I remember back when they said, oh, when audio first came out, the tapes, is this real or is this Memorex? Yeah. So I could see something like that, Ed, because my husband, you know, bless him, he says, oh, Linda, that's AI that made up that video. And I said, really? That's pretty amazing. You know, we have to challenge that. Is this real or is this AI? That's where I could see the pluses and the minuses. It's there for us. But in two years time, how much work is going to be done by actual human beings? It's going to be an interesting shift, isn't it? And it's oh. never going to stop. So this is going to be a constant evolutionary, almost revolutionary path forward. 2025, what I'm seeing is that we're going in with a lot of companies that are starting to build AI agents for different use cases. Mm -hmm. And 2025 is actually going to be the manifestation of those agents into reality, which take chatbot fours to a whole new level of capability. Mm -hmm. uh, that means they can really help us directly automate our processes without having to go in and learn how to figure a, a CRM system. So as much yes. as they love CRM solutions, the problem is, is that there's so much capability. Most of them are incredibly challenging to configure and maximize our actual use out of it without mm -hmm. a degree in, in a specific tool configuration methodology. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how things carry forward and how powerful these AI agents come along in sales and marketing and operational efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. Well, even in medicine, I've seen yeah. that in medicine, right? And, and they test this, I mean, you know, back in the day, right? Beta testing is really fantastic, but they test it and they're seeing, this is another thing that just comes to mind, right, Ed? They're seeing that the AI system is like 98 point something percent on board versus the opportunity of a failure with a human. So you could see where that's going because we are not thinking anymore. We're not researching or exploring anymore. We're giving our power of thought to somebody else or something else. And then eventually, where will we be? Oh, well, it's helping us, but will we be creative? Will we be, oh, no, that doesn't work because AI says you don't exist. You've heard about those types of situations where... Somebody, uh, and this is before AI, right? Somebody got hacked and they stole their identity and they had to jump through hoops to try to prove that they were still alive. It's, it's only as good as a computer. If I go back to my mainframe days, right? A computer is only as good as the person inputting the data. And the same is going to apply to AI. It's a little more intelligent, 
So even your phone, as we're talking, I can guarantee you it's picking up what I've said and I will see all kinds of advertisements for uh, AI on there. Yeah. Google got busted for some of that. Yeah. So, so we just need to proceed with caution and understand that it's a brave new world technology innovation, but, Look at the atom bomb. That was innovation as well. And what did it do? It destroyed. We have to develop a good protocol for everybody. And then I think we'll see a lot more advancement. As well as defense against the bad actors out there. Oh, well, that we we could stay on for another hour (laughs) talking about that. But that's why it's imperative that we go back and listen to our intuition because your gut instincts will not lie. Picks up energy before you do. My only commentary to everything we just talked about is that there is a place for humanity. It's going to be in our ingenuity, our creativity. We are still Mm -hmm. architects of our lives and the Mm -hmm. architects relative to how to leverage all these other capabilities, people, process, technology, and culture to drive our dreams forward, both individually as well as collectively. We're not going to stop the train. It's a massive train on massive tracks. That's Nor got should we. Momentum. Mm-hmm. And it's running downhill right now. Um, it may hit some uphill pieces and parts, mm-hmm. but there are so many advents of the next version of the internet, quantum, hybrid quantum in between now and ultimately quantum and quantum net. Just the impact of being able to have so much data so readily communicated. Oh, yeah. For the most part, a lot more secure, although that comes down to our own individual willingness to take the precautions necessary to protect our entry Mm -hmm. points from those solutions. But as I look forward and they talk about generative AI and the ability to think like humans, a lot more of that is going to occur. How it manifests, I can't say, but it's either embrace it and manage it or be managed by it and get run over by it. it. Exactly. So you understand. Because my exp- I'm a hardware person, you know, um, 33 and a third years. I I love mainframes. They are just unbelievable. The processing power of a mainframe is is so quick. Could you imagine the next generation and the next generation? And that's why I said you got to question whether it's real or Memorex, right? The design of a mainframe today, and you probably see it in some of the other computers as well, they will not fail. They won't have an outage because they have backup, backup, backup. And it's the same thing with the software, All right? Oh, this is what, oh, I'm going to go here. Oh, I'm going to go here. So they have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? And going with your point, the newer generation coming in, I had the privilege of sitting with this one guy who is an expert in AI. And I just sat in awe of him. I'm like, how, how did you do that? One, two, three, it's done. Big. Okay. So the new generation of humans are adapting as well. So final takeaway for our audience. If there's one thing you could share with them to say, you really must consider this as part of your life and business success, what would that be? I said to question everything. And we kind of just segued into this. And what why I say question everything, you ask yourself, oh, I have a reaction to this. Why am because normally it's the messengers. Our soul wants to be whole. So people will come into our life as messengers. And if you have a reaction to that, you have to ask yourself, why? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I doing this? Am I doing this for me? Or am I doing this for somebody else? Will I see the value? I call it healthy skepticism, right? And maintaining our own integrity to ourselves, which will allow us to grow. But don't take someone else's word for it. Question everything. But not in a uh, conspiracy theory way. But you just, hmm, does that feel right? Oh, my gut says no. Okay, then I need to walk away. Or at least to dig down into it a bit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, that would be my answer to your question. Question everything. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you all for joining us today for this lightning conversation with Linda Grace Farley. 
Her holistic approach to life and business has given us much to reflect on. As we wrap up, we'd like to ask you, our listeners, what area of your life do you feel needs the most balance right now? And how might a holistic approach help you achieve that balance? We'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences in our comments and on our social media channels. A big thank you to Linda for sharing her wisdom and insights with us today. And remember, achieving harmony in life is a journey, not a destination. Until next time, keep striving for that balance and don't forget to take care of your mind, body, and spirit. Stay curious, stay open, and keep growing. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye.